Five years have passed, five summers, with the length of five long winters. And again I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a sweet inland murmur. Once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs, which on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of a more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day has come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits among the woods and copses lose themselves, nor with their green and simple hue disturb the wild green landscape. Once again I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild, these pastoral farms, green to the very door, and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees, with some uncertain notice, as might seem, of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods, or of some hermit's cave, where by his fire the hermit sits alone. Five years, five summers, five winters, right out of the gate, Wordsworth does something unconventional with his poem. He repeats the same word three times in two lines. And then later in the same stanza, he does it uh, with the words again, secluded, green, hedgerows, wood, and hermit. If Wordsworth were a 10th grader and I were his poetry teacher, I would ask him to redo the work. I would mistakenly too, I, I, I would be wrong. But I would say to him, oh, no, you can't do that. That's not how poetry works. You, you have to find a different word the second time um, because that's what poetry does. But he doesn't, and we can be pretty sure that he's not doing this for the reason that a 10th grader usually would. <laughs> and that is that they can't think of another word. But we can be sure, I, I, I can tell you, I, I've read his poems. Um, I'm sure many of you have, you know, it's not because he couldn't think of another word. So we can assume that there's some pretty good reason that he's doing this, that he would use the same words repeatedly. And I, I'm going to go out a little bit on a limb with a couple of the reasons that I think this might be. Uh, and I hope that you're going to, by the end, I hope that I can, I can sell you on the idea um, that it does have something to do with just saying, stop right there. There's something about this poem, and especially in the first stanza. When I, have, when I have tried to read this poem and I'm in a hurry, it doesn't work. This poem does not skim. You, you know, if you're trying to hurry through the poem, the first stanza just stops you dead in your tracks. And um, word choices that change, it, they're trying to describe the same thing and change along their way, they travel. Right? It's, it's augmenting meaning. It's a, it's a traveling sort of feeling that it establishes. I really think that part of what he's doing by using the same word, and it's often two lines in a row, is to sort of slow things down and say, stop. I want you to halt. Um, it revisits. And when we revisit, we circle back in time. It's, it's one of the ways in which I would say he is playing with time all the way through the and when we think about time, we usually think of traveling along the way you do in a car. But Wordsworth stops us. He, he says, five, five, listen to me, five. Go back. I said, five, seclusion. I mean seclusion. Woods. I tell you, woods. So he wants us to stay there and linger in a way that lays an emphasis on the elements of the scene. Um, and he does that, too. That's, that's one of the reasons that it doesn't skim well, because it just doesn't travel anywhere. That whole first stanza, you really, you know right away where you are, you know within a line or two, and yet he stays there, right, in that, those woods with the water, and the hedgerows, and the, the um, well, even the smoke and the hermit. And he, he establishes a tone of meditative silence with terms like murmur, seclusion, deep seclusion, repose, silence, and finally the image of the hermit sitting alone. 